I'm Thomas Homer Dixon, Director of the Peace and Conflict Studies Program at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm a Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political Science there. Can you walk us through the thesis of the Upside of Down? The conclusion I come to is that there's an increasing likelihood of some kind of uh, systemic breakdown in some regions of the world, perhaps even globally, that, uh, that could hurt large numbers of people around the planet. But I also suggest that certain kinds of crisis or breakdown can lead to opportunities for deep renewal of our institutions and technologies. And that's why the title of the book is The Upside of Down. Sometimes human beings only actually get motivated to make deep changes in the way they do things when there is a crisis. One of the six stresses or potential crises that you discuss in your book is the issue of climate change. Can you talk a little bit about why it is such a complex problem and the difficulties behind confronting it unilaterally? Climate change is often characterized by people who know the problem well as kind of the, the problem from hell. It's just staggeringly difficult to figure out how we're going to solve it, and it's going to be staggeringly difficult to actually solve it in part because of particular characteristics of the problem. It develops over long periods of time, often very slowly. It might develop slowly for quite a while, and then suddenly you get some sharp, sudden change in the nature of the climate. And most fundamentally, it's a, it's a classic tragedy of the commons problem, where every individual in the system, individual people, corporations, and countries, has an incentive to let other people pick up the costs of dealing with climate change while they continue to pollute. It's what's called a free rider problem. How important is active engagement by key nations like the U.S. and China on the issue of climate change? If and when the United States and China both recognize that this is a very significant problem and needs to be addressed because climate change can affect their interests very directly, then I think they will provide the core for more general, very aggressive action by the rest of the international community. If two countries alone, can, who account for 50 percent of the problem, move, then that gives, uh, gives uh, the rest a structure potentially within which they can also make significant cuts without feeling that they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. Now, also, it's quite true that if the United States and China begin to collaborate on this problem, they can set up uh, some incentives within the international system, financial arrangements, international institutions that provide both incentives and penalties for countries and corporations to actually make a big difference and reduce their, their carbon dioxide output. China and the United States together could actually create sufficient, in a sense, coercion within the international system to make other, other entities go along. Until that happens, I don't expect to see a lot of movement not, certainly not the kind of movement that we need on carbon dioxide reduction, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 90 percent reduction within the next five decades. In the first chapter of your book, you talk about interconnectivity as a multiplier of the stresses that society confronts. Can interconnectivity also act as an alleviator of those same stresses? We've seen an enormous increase in connectivity in recent decades. We've also seen a very substantial increase in the speed with which we transfer material, energy, and especially information among us. Now, this increased connectivity can often be a very good thing and can produce wealth, can contribute to the production of wealth because you get synergies among ideas, you can uh, increase capital flows from one part of the world to another. But sometimes this connectivity can also contribute to what specialists would call cascading failures within our financial systems, sometimes within ecological systems and economic systems, where a small shock or perturbation in one part of the system can lead to damage a long way away. And we've seen examples of that in various places. For instance, in 97, we saw the devaluation of a minor currency, the Thai baht in Southeast Asia, that in a year and a half produced an enormous financial crisis for the whole planet. In 2003, we saw a, uh, a, an outbreak of a disease, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome in southern China spread around the planet and uh, in my home country produce a medical crisis. Now, connectivity doesn't always have to produce these kinds of crises 
And one of my arguments is that we need to be much more selective about the kinds of connectivity that we encourage within our societies and, and around the globe. What is the role of multilateralism and multilateral institutions in alleviating the stresses that you delineate in your book? Now, one of the reasons I'm a big proponent of multilateralism in the international system is because it's essentially a decentralized problem-solving process. You have a lot of different countries who are collaborating loosely together to solve common problems, but they may try things a little bit differently here and there, and in the process, uh, come up with really good solutions a lot faster. I think in general that kind of decentralized approach is much more effective than a hierarchical approach led by, say, a great power or, for instance, sometime generations from now, some kind of world government. So what we need to do in the world right now is make multilateralism work better, not jettison it. Can you think of any efforts that the UN could undertake to make itself better prepared to meet the stresses that you outline in your book? There are institutional deficiencies within the United Nations. Uh, for instance, uh, a lack of adequate rep representation, I believe, of significant portions of the human population within the Security Council. Uh, significant developing countries, for instance, uh, uh, India and Brazil, and very important economic powers such as Germany and Japan. Uh, there's reluctance to change this institutional structure in a fundamental way because as soon as you pull one thread, there's a concern that the whole thing will start to unravel. My expectation is pragmatically, as we deal with real crises that the human species faces, that we will see, we will see pragmatic adjustments in the structure of the institution that over time will make it really look quite different. What it, what it will look like, though, eventually, it's hard to say.